course, controversial song, Horse Vessel Lied, or Horse Vessel Song, of course, uh, national anthem, of course, of the Nazi Party. Uh, so anyway, of course, banned in Germany and also Austria, of course, today. So anyway, welcome you back, Daniel Simon at Baton Rouge Community College. Everybody, everybody's had a great weekend uh, overall, of course. Short week this week. I didn't have, of course, a lecture on Monday uh, earlier. Of course, I gave you like an assignment to do uh, this week. I think it was like a little video quiz assignment I gave you. Uh, but, uh, of course, this week and next week, I'll be, of course, moving on to talk about the rise of fascism, uh, of course, World War II uh, that breaks out, uh, which a lot of it had to do with Adolf Hitler, of course, and Nazi Germany, which I'll be talking a lot about today and, of course, part of also next week as well. So it looks like we got a bunch of students I didn't watch it live today. Um, looks like we have Brianna watching, I know, this morning. Good morning, uh, Brianna. Also, Lulu's also watching uh, as well, along with Courtney. Good morning. And also, Brittany. Hey, Brittany. Uh, of course, and also, Steph is also watching. Good morning. And also, Christopher. Hey. And also, Elizabeth as well. So, everybody, everybody had a great week overall. Of course, getting closer to the end of the semester, you know, because we get too close to, you know, World War II and all that, you know, pretty much almost getting to the end, uh, you know, because World War II and then, of course, the Cold War era. Uh, after that. So I uh, did want to remind you about various assignments that are out there, of course, right now. I know y'all should be working on the second exam right now. That's the main thing uh, to get out the way. Uh, you do have that World War I quiz I've got, which I think had some 19th century stuff I put in it also as well. And then I gave you that second exam bonus quiz, uh, which is like a video, a documentary assignment on uh, the Red Baron. I wanted you to watch, of course, uh, who was one of the greatest, you know, World War One aces in uh, that war. Uh, so, yeah, those are the main assignments that I've got out right now uh, that are kind of important. Uh, now, we do have other things. I know later in the month we've got, I think next week, uh, I know at the end of next week, we've got that third vocabulary that's due. And I did push back the book report. So uh, you'll kind of go online on Canvas, but you'll see that the book report uh, it's going to be due, I think it's on uh, November 28th, which is a Monday. So I did push it back a bunch of days, because uh, mostly because of Thanksgiving, and I'm kind of kind of, kind of of be kind of out of town around that time. So probably won't have time to grade them you know, until later. So so anyway, uh, just kind of talking about announcements I've got right now, of course, uh, for the class, all that. So uh, anyway, today, uh, like I said, I'm going to talk about mostly, uh, you know, what happened between the wars, uh, especially with the rise of fascism in Europe, because fascism was really one of the major components that really led to why, why World War II, of course, broke out in 1939. Uh, it does kind of cause similar problems, you know, in Asia with the Japanese fascists as well. I'm kind of, I probably won't talk about them today, but I'll get to them probably next week, talk about them. Uh, but for a Second World War, of course, they also called it as well. But if you have any comments, of course, questions about this lecture, you know, during the live stream, you can, of course, leave me comments. Or also, of course, you can leave me comments later on my channel. Or you can also in Canvas, of course, if you got a question about something, you can also do that there as well. So uh, anyway, um, yeah, I'm going to talk mostly about kind of what happened after, you know, after, you know, World War I, of course, ended. Uh, of course, you get the rise of these fascist type dictators in Europe like Mussolini uh, and also Adolf Hitler, who was obviously more famous. Uh, but I did want to get into some of the background of what happened to, you know, lead to why, you know, World War II happened. Uh, with the rise of fascism, and a lot of it had to do with what happened in Germany after World War I, because Germany did not fare well, if you know about this, uh, after after the war. Uh, after uh, after Germany lost the war uh, to the Allies, uh, the Germans founded a new state, which was called the Weimar Republic, at least that's what they called it in the West. Uh, and what happened uh, at the end of the war was that the... Um, the constitutional monarchy, which had been under the Hohenzollerns, it basically collapsed uh, due to the so-called German Revolution that occurred in Germany between 1918 and 1919. Uh, predominantly, like leftists took over the country, like socialists, social democrats, and they put in a republican-type government. Is what they ended up doing, 
Uh, and um, and so they, they, the Social Democrats, which still rule, by the way, Germany today, that's the main political party that's in power, you know, like Olaf Scholz, uh, as a member of the Social Democrats, they basically formed this new state called the Weimar Republic, which was kind of like the nickname they called it from 1919 uh, 19 to about 1933. Although it had other names, uh, I think the official names that they actually called, if you want, uh, they still called the German Reich. A lot of people did, uh, if you know about that. And they also have the German Republic, Dutch Republic, you see there uh, as well. But those are various names that it was basically called. So you kind of see here, image, basically uh, the Weimar Republic. They got, got that new German flag they start to use, of course, afterwards. You can see it's black, red, and yellow, you know, the current I guess flag we got now, uh, and then you got, I think that's uh, Paul von Hindenburg on the left, who was one of their presidents. That was it. Uh, it was called Weimar because that's where uh, the Constitutional Assembly was first established. You know, at that time, uh, I think really in 1919, I think was the actual year itself. And uh, but uh, if you know about it, it was very as a liberal democratic republic. That's one thing about it that was very famous, uh, which included direct representation. Uh, you know, where people could vote, uh, not just men, by the way, but women, women could vote, uh, could also hold office. Uh, and so uh, this particular government that came into power had a bicameral legislature, by the way, uh, as well, uh, which the so-called German parliament had two houses. Uh, they had the Reichstag and then they had what they call the Reichsrat. And the Reichstag, what's the difference between the two Two different ones. Uh, the uh, Reichs, the Reichsrat was more like an upper house where the states in Germany would appoint like officials to it, basically. And the Reichstag was kind of like the like our United States House of Representatives, uh, where people are directly elected to it. And that's basically the main body that was probably more important uh, because of because of that issue with that. Uh, today, by the way, uh, the German parliament is called the Bundestag or Federal Diet, uh, if you want, which, like I said, it's more more similar to the Reichstag uh, that we're talking about uh, or House of Representatives of America or House of Commons in Britain, that kind of thing. And I told you Schultz, although Schultz, of course, of course, is the current chancellor right now uh, of Germany. Uh, and that is one thing that is true about Germany. They got rid of the monarchy, if you know about this. Uh, and so they have a chancellor who's like a prime minister that runs the government. And then they had a president, like the president of Germany, uh, that they had, uh, which was more for like ceremonial type duties is what it was. And so that's what Paul von Hindenburg is kind of famous for. He's one of the first that did that. Now, I think I've got uh, some of the early presidents of the German Republic. They were kind of famous, like Frederick, Frederick uh, Ebert, of course, on the left, you see there. Uh, who was the first president of Germany from 1919 to 1925. And then on the right, you got Paul von Hindenburg, uh, who was uh, the second president of Germany from 1925 to 1934. And if you know about Hindenburg, I think I talked about him before. He was a famous you know, German general in World War I. Uh, of course, famous the Hindenburg name, and hey, I've heard of the Hindenburg Zeppelin that blew up in New Jersey. <laughs> I'll kind of get into it and talk about also like the failures of the Weimar Republic, because that's one thing about the Republic. It, it kind of founders uh, after it gets founded, uh, which a lot of it had to do with the fact that Germany after World War I uh, had to pay a lot of debts, not just the war reparations, which I think I told you was $33 billion. Uh, They also had to pay off all their debts they owed from the war, which I've got the numbers right here, but they think that $72 billion was the amount of, uh, like $72 billion, I think that must have been in, I think in what would be now German Dutch marks, would be like a trillion dollars today in American dollars, you know, basically. Uh, so they had to pay this back, basically, and believe it or not, they did. Like the war reparations, I know, uh, were paid back by Germany uh, by 2010 like 12 years ago. I think Hitler didn't want to pay it, but uh, that's something they did do uh, over time. And so they, they think the combination of the high debts uh, and all the, you know, the thing, the, all the money they owe from the war reparations, what it basically did was it created like really high, high inflation uh, in Germany. 
we think inflation is bad now, but inflation in Germany, and like say around 1923, uh, was pretty awful. Uh, money itself was worthless. You could hardly buy anything with it. Uh, in fact, we don't take a wheelbarrow full of money to actually go buy uh, any money. And money is so worthless that this woman on the right is actually taking the money and putting it in a furnace, like to burn it to keep warm in the winter because buying wood would be probably more expensive. <laughs> so uh, that's the kind of thing kind of they use it for different things, like even wearing it and playing with toys. And I think they put it on walls, wallpaper and things like that. And I think it got to the point where they're even printing a million, a million mark, like a million dollar bill. It was like worthless. Uh, so that's the kind of stuff that really, you know, will cause later, like Adolf Hitler and Nazi Germany to uh, eventually come to power because of all this inflation and bad economic times. And then eventually, if you know, we'll see later the, the Great Depression. Uh, when you get the stock market crash of uh, the United States in October 1929, uh, that's going to enable Hitler to eventually rise to power uh, because of bad economic times. Now, I'm going to talk about the rise of fascism in Europe first. So kind of, because it doesn't really start in Germany. But actually, if you talk much about, you know, what happened with fascism, it really started predominantly in, like, Italy, like in other countries. And uh, if you look at fascism itself, it was all because of the fact, well, part of why it became popular was because of the fact that democracy, uh, capitalism, and things like that weren't really working, you know, in a lot of these countries like Germany and Italy. And so they started listening to these totalitarian dictators, you know, and they pretty much even began to, to improve their economies, uh, things like that. But, of course, it would later lead to war, uh, you know, in the future. Let me talk about, like, what exactly fascism is. Like, what, what is a good definition of fascism? Uh, fascism is like a, a right-wing type political uh, philosophy and movement uh, that was uh, composed of ultra-nationalism. They're very very concerned about, you know, the state and trying to restore order to, I guess, the way it was before the war. Uh, and um, they wanted to, you know, restore their country to greatness, have a great military, great economy, uh, even expand their country to take over parts of Europe or the world. Uh, and so that's the kind of, you know, movement that they they basically pushed a lot, uh, the fascists. And although Mussolini, who, you know, was considered one of the first fascists, uh, didn't really see it as a political like ideology. He saw it more as a political movement that was like a populist thing, like a populist type movement uh, is what he kind of saw it as. Um, in fact, Mussolini saw it not as a left or a right wing ideology. That's something that was that he actually believed. He, wasn't, he didn't think it was right wing. Uh, some people don't think it's either right wing or left wing. It was like neither one. Um, but he, he kind of saw this idea of trying to restore and make Italy a major power, kind of like the Romans a long time ago. And so that's the idea of what these fascists wanted to do. Uh, the only thing about the fascists is that they tended to oppose things like they didn't like anarchism, didn't like democracy. Civil liberties are limited, you know, under a fascist type, you know, regime. Uh, they've got a lot of secret police forces and spying on people and things like that that they have. So liberalism, Marxism, like left left wing things are kind of rejected uh, by them. In fact, part of why fascism developed was because of the hatred of like Marxism and communism and things like that. Uh, that's what 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 pretty much they you know did. So that's why it kind of came about uh, because of that. Uh, and uh, so yeah, they tried to do this in Italy. They tried to do this in Germany. I guess in Spain. I think in parts of South America, like in I think Chile and other places, you know. I think even like in Peru, I think for a while, I think there was kind of a movement, I think it was, to try to do that uh, also, or Argentina, I think also as well. Uh, here's, by the way, a quote by uh, Mussolini I kind of share with you about uh, his, his his movement. But he said that fascism was not the nursling of a doctrine previously dra drafted at a desk. It was born out of the need of action. That was the one that he said the most, and was action. Uh, it was not a party. Uh, but more like a movement, like a populist movement is basically what it was. And then over time, it became like a political type party in the end. I'll get to the fascists in Germany. Uh, they're very, you know, they're racist. Uh, they kind of view the Germans, like the Germans as some kind of 
of master race. Uh, they kind of view like Jews, Slavs, other types of people uh, as being inferior. They even talk about, you know, German Nazi sci Aryan science and uh, things like that uh, as well. But Mussolini here, uh, you see, uh, was considered the first fascist that would take control of a country uh, in, in Europe. Uh, in fact, he was the ruler of Italy from 1922 uh, to 1945, uh, serving as prime minister uh, of, of the country. Uh, the weird thing about Mussolini uh, was that he was actually not originally a fascist. In fact, he started out as a socialist uh, going back to World War I, uh, where he had been a veteran in the war. Uh, he was a school teacher. Uh, he was a journalist, I think, of actually a socialist newspaper. And then he kind of turned fascist, of course, after the war, because I guess he didn't really like what the Marxists were kind of doing uh, in all that. He was later called Il Duce, which I'll kind of explain later uh, about that. Uh, and um, in 1919, uh, Mussolini formed the National Fascist Party, also usually called the PNF uh, for short, which, like I said, was heavily rooted in Italian national, like extreme nationalists. Uh, they wanted to make Italy this major power in Europe that would rival like, the, like a modern Roman Empire, I think is kind of what he viewed. Uh, where you know the, the Italians would basically control the Mediterranean Sea, uh, as the Roman Empire did uh, a long time ago. By the way, the uh, the actual name is the National Fascist Party is the Partito Nacional Fascista, Fascista I guess they say it in Italian, PNF, I guess for, for short. Uh, so that's where we get the word fascist kind of being born uh, from that. But if you know if you know about the, the fascists, like the whole, you know, the name of the origin of, you know, where it came from uh, was from the fasci symbol, uh, you know, which was adopted from Roman times, like in ancient Rome uh, a long time ago. And the fasci was a symbol of Roman power and authority where I guess a certain ruler had power over another. Uh, and... Um, the word fasci is a is a, a Latin word that means bundle because uh, it was like a bundle of wooden rods that are bound around an axe, which I think it implied that the Roman people uh, were many but one. Uh, and the, the fasci has been used a lot. Uh, and I think even in America, if you can go to like, I want to say the um, U.S. Congress, and they have fasci's on the wall, like in the House of Representatives. So it has been used like in the United States. Uh, as well. So some of the, fasci the fascists kind of took uh, Italy and they began incorporating it like in flags and other symbols and things like that, uh, etc. Uh, going back to this image right here, of course, one thing about the fascists, they had like these paramilitary forces that they created uh, in the country, which were often called the black shirts is what they were dubbed. Uh, and uh, they were used basically to protect Mussolini, kind of like bodyguards, but also to, I guess, go out and beat up uh, anybody that was a threat to them, uh, like Marxists, like com communists or socialists uh, that were in, con in the country. And it was originally called the Voluntary Militia, is what it was called for national security. That was the actual original name uh, it was dubbed. And I think they say at one point, like when Mussolini came to power, uh, they had about 300,000 people or more uh, that were actually in it. And later, the Nazis would kind of copy them. Like the, I think the brown shirts or the Nazi SA, uh, of course, would be kind of similar to that organization <clears throat> that he uh, created uh, originally. So he would, he would use the black shirts to basically uh, take power, of course, uh, in, in the country. Uh, the other thing that he, of course, he kind of shared this with Hugh, of course, you know, if you know about the fascists, they're very famous for uh, the so-called fascist salute. Uh, that's big. Of course, there's different versions of it. I know the one with the um, Italian salute, it's more upright with the right hand uh, extending upward. And then, of course, the Nazi salute is more of an angle, you know, kind of more uh, angled salute in um they think that the um, fascist salute uh, originate also from Roman times. They think we got an image there of Marcus Aurelius, famous Roman emperor, 
uh, from the second century AD, uh, giving like a salute. And so they think that's maybe where the origins of, of salutes and the idea of, you know, people doing salutes and things like that uh, has been around. Uh, I think the communist salute is similar to it where they have like an extended fist, you know, like that basically uh, instead of the hand out, you know, instead like that. So, so that's kind of the difference between the two, you know. Don't do it with the left, though. That's like, don't get the, I think it was some story I heard about somebody did a Nazi suit with a left hand. They got in trouble. <laughs> so you had to do it with the right for some reason. So anyway, but um, let me talk about also Benito Mussolini, uh, how he also took power. Uh, in uh, 1922, uh, they had this thing that almost happened where Italy was on the verge of civil war, like between like going back to like, the end of World War I to like the early 1920s, uh, you basically had fascists versus socialists. They're basically about to kill each other uh, in the country. And you had also a lot of strikes uh, all over the country as well. And so Mussolini decided to stage this national demonstration uh, in the country that basically said that, hey, if you don't basically put us in power, uh, the fascists, you're going to be looking at a civil war. Uh, and so uh, there's like the so-called March on Rome uh, that they usually kind of nickname it later. Uh, but it was part of a coup d'etat uh, that occurred. And uh, Mussolini, of course, uh, with his, some, I think on some, he didn't really walk the whole thing, which took place over several days uh, in, in outside of Rome in Rome uh, between October 27th to uh, the 29th, uh, 1922. Uh, but what happened was to prevent a civil war, the king, the king of Italy, who was Vic, Victor Emmanuel III, decided to appoint Mussolini to put him in power and allow the fascists to come in and take over the government. And that's what happened. They did all this to avoid basically armed conflict between fascists uh, and, com and, I guess, socialists. They've had a lot of problems with Italy. I know it, after the war, they had they had communists or socialists that tried to take over the country again, like later on, uh, left-wing people. But that's something that occurred with that. And so with Mussolini, you know, taking power uh, right afterwards in 1922, uh, he then began to establish a totalitarian dictatorship, which he would do within a few years. Like his policies would create that uh, over time. And... Um, one thing, one thing about Mussolini, of course, uh, if you know about him, uh, he uh, became this militarized type leader, uh, you know, using, using the title, which is right here. He called himself the Il Duce, uh, which means uh, either the Duke or the leader is what it means. Uh, and um, <clears throat> they, think, they think that Hitler was heavily influenced by Mussolini, like his style of rule, even the way he dressed, uh, things like that. Now, I know there was a story later where uh, Hitler sent an autographed copy of Mussolini to him to get it signed because he was kind of a big idol of Mussolini. And Mussolini sent it back to him unsigned saying, who are you? Uh, that kind of thing. So, yeah, that's the next thing we're going to talk about next. We're going to, of course, get into uh, and talk about the rise of Adolf Hitler, of course, uh, in Nazi Germany, which of course, we'll eventually take over uh, Germany in the 1930s. Uh, let me first talk a little bit about the background of Adolf Hitler. If you know about Hitler, he was not originally German. He was, of course, from Austria. Uh, in fact, if you want to know the early life about Hitler, uh, he was born in April, April 20th, 1889, Bernau am Inn, uh, now Austria, which at the time was part of the Austro, I guess part of the Austro-Hungarian Empire, uh, still uh, at the time. And um, I'll kind of talk about his early life a little bit to kind of give you some more background. But Hitler, Hitler, uh, you know, would later end up being chancellor of Germany, 1933 out of 1945. Uh, he uh, pretty much was a totalitarian dictator. And of course, we'll see later. But early on, uh, that wasn't the way things were with Hitler. Hitler, of course, uh, if you know about it, was kind of a high school dropout. He never completed high school uh, in Austria, uh, flunked out, I think, his senior year. Uh, and he later moved to Vienna, where he dreamed of being an artist, uh, but couldn't get into art school either. Uh, and then 
1913, if you know about it, he moved to um, Munich, Bavaria in Germany, and of course, World War I uh, broke out. Uh, that's an image, of course, of Hitler, kind of schoolboy Hitler on the right. And the one on the left is Hitler when he was uh, in the uh, Bavarian, uh, he was in a Bavarian regiment in Germany uh, during the war. I think he was a corporal, Lance Corporal, I think was his highest rank uh, that he obtained uh, He obtained during the war. And that's him on the far left under that X. You can see there too uh, in that image uh, overall. Uh, Hitler, Hitler later, uh, what happened was after the war, uh, he, jo he joined, uh, he was still in the, he was still in the German army, uh, and he heard about these political parties that were in Munich, Bavaria. It was one that was called the German Workers' Party, uh, that he decided to join, uh, if you know about Hitler. Uh, and so, um, eventually, uh, if you know, he changed the name, uh, here's, of course, the image of Hitler, right? he changed the name to the Nazi Party, it was called the German Workers' Party, but uh, eventually, it's called the National Socialist German Workers' Party, uh, also called the NSDAP, uh, which his enemies, you know, called it Nazi, uh, if you know about that, uh, starting in the 1920s. Uh, and um, over time, by 1920, you know, they adopted this new flag, which represented, you know, what their movement was. And you can see here, kind of, Span it right here, but you can see that the swastika, you know, became the main symbol, which I guess they adopt the symbol because, you know, the communists had the, uh, the you know, the, the sickle and the hammer, that kind of thing. It was kind of similar to like a red flag, too, I guess. Uh, and um, they often call it the so called Hocken Cruise, I think is another name that they sometimes nicknamed it. And you can see, obviously, design the flag. Uh, with the red, black, and white colors, which were kind of traditional colors that were part of the, I guess, the original German flag a long time ago. But they think that the um, swastika, I know it was a symbol that they think originated, they think it originated, they think, uh, in in the Far East, like with, like, Hinduism and Buddhism, you know about that? It was a symbol of, like, luck, fortune, uh, pros prosperity, uh, but over time, you know, what happened was the Germans basically incorporated it into like the Iron Cross, uh, the eagle being used from like Roman times and things like that. Uh, and so uh, it becomes kind of a thing thing of evil. Uh, if you know about that, I guess during the war and after the war to some people, but like in Eastern religions, it's still used, you know, as a symbol, but has nothing to do with Nazism and the Aryan master race and all of that. So yeah, they incorporate, you know, the you can see the not the uh, swastika with, of course, the eagle and things like that, etc. Uh, Hitler was also known for a lot of men under him that would be part of the Nazi Party and later, you know, head up, you know, Nazi Germany later, which I want to kind of talk a little bit about today uh, as well, because we talk about these men probably later, maybe off and on, but um, yeah, these two men right here were pretty famous. Uh, Hermann Goering, who you see on the left, uh, was the head of the German Luftwaffe, uh, which would be the German Air Force, especially from 1933 to 1945. Uh, he joined the Nazi Party also early uh, in the 1920s. Uh, Goering was originally a World War I ace that knew the Red Baron, uh, and he's famous later for founding some of the uh, early apparatuses of the Nazis, like the Gestapo, which is the German secret police. And then he also founded some of the early concentration camps uh, in Germany, like Dachau, you may have heard of uh, as well. So he was kind of known for that. And late, later he was accused of war crimes and found guilty at the Nuremberg trials uh, after World War II ended. And was, he, I think he committed suicide, but he would have been executed, basically. Uh, then on the right, uh, you've got Himmler, Heinrich Himmler, uh, who later headed up the Gestapo, uh, the Nazi secret police. And then he also led this thing called the SS, which is kind of notorious. Uh, the Schutzstaffel were also called the Black Shirts, uh, also usually two words. And uh, the uh, SS was this national security force of Nazi Germany. Uh, it was also used as Hitler's bodyguards uh, as well. And then uh, if you know about it, during World War II, they had this 
also had the so-called Wapen SS that they had as well, which was a kind of a special forces type unit uh, of the SS that was kind of considered elite. They were all kind of area Nazis and in it that were kind of big. Uh, and so um, that was something that they were they were kind of famous for. And uh, if you know if you know about um, you know the SS, they pretty much ran a lot of the concentration death camps uh, in World War II. Uh, that led to you know why the Holocaust happened. So they end up killing Jews and other people, you know, uh, that they consider to be inferior. Uh, and so that's something that the SS is kind of kind of known for. Uh, also, another man that was big under Hitler was Ernest Rahm, uh, who was the head of the SA, or also called the Brown Shirts. Uh, the SA was actually called the Sturmabteilung, which meant uh, storm detachment uh, and um, it was basically a Nazi paramilitary wing uh, that that Hitler Hitler created uh, after after World War One with the this particular Nazi party, and it was kind of also used as like Hitler's bodyguards as well as the SS was. And uh, Ernest Rahm was very close to Hitler. They were kind of friends originally when they first joined the party together. Uh, although if you know about it, Hitler later turned on Rahm and had him killed in 1934. Uh, in the uh, so-called uh, Night of the Long Knives uh, purge they have later with the Nazis. So we'll get to them later, but the SA had like several million men uh, that were actually in it. And really up to the early 1930s, uh, Rahm was pretty powerful. He was up there with Hitler in power in the Nazi party, and so Hitler had to later have him eliminated uh, because of that. That guy, that guy, by the way, that song we were, I was playing, that Horse Vessel song, uh, Horse Vessel was a member of the SA, uh, the Brown Shirts. He supposedly wrote the song, uh, which I think the original song was called Raise the Flag, is what it was called. Uh, but he originally wrote it. He was a member of the SA, and he was killed in some kind of street battle against communists. And you kind of became immortalized, you know, in that song with the name of it. Uh, so I guess he was kind of like a martyr, I guess, of the Nazis later. Uh, he also had Joseph Goebbels. You may have heard about Goebbels. Uh, he was Hitler's minister of propaganda and media. And uh, Goebbels was a master of using the news and propaganda and things like that to brainwash people uh, in Nazi Germany. And so he's part of the reason why, you know, the Nazis were able to commit all the atrocities they did after, after, during, during World War II, like elimination of Jews and other people like that. And pretty much they thought that Jews were non-human, uh, et cetera, because of, of their, you know, beliefs through, through using propaganda, uh, et cetera. So they controlled like the movies and radio and pretty much anything that had to do with stuff that was me, like music, et cetera. Oh yeah, Martin Borman. I usually I usually kind of mention about him as well. Martin Borman was pretty big, uh, also as well. He was uh, basically the head of the chancellery, like the main government building uh, of, of basically of Nazi Germany in Berlin. Uh, he was really Hitler's right hand man, uh, probably one of the highest men that was really uh, in in the Nazi party uh, as well. Uh, and uh, they're not sure what happened to Bormann after the war. They think he may have been killed uh, at the end of World War II, but he was basically uh, uh, Hitler's main party secretary, I think was what his main title was uh, overall. Oh, and I did want to mention about something that was kind of famous about the Nazis. The Nazis had the Hitler Youth uh, also as well. You probably heard of that also. The Hitler Youth was this youth organization the Nazis created uh, starting, I guess, really going back to when Hitler came, when I guess when the Nazis were formed, they kind of formed it back in the 20s. But I know in 1933, it was something they began to push on all German boys uh, that had to go through, you know, education uh, from the age of 10 to 18. And so they molded basically men into elite Nazis uh, is more amounted to. Uh, they did have different leaders. Uh, Balder von Schirach, uh, Ar Ar Arthur Axman was another one that was also in it uh, as well. Uh, and so um, brainwashed people to, you know, be like Nazis when they get older. Uh, so I guess it's kind of like the Nazi Boy Scouts would be kind of what it kind of was. I think that Pope they had a few years ago, if I remember correctly, 
uh, was there was a pope they had a, there was a German pope they had who was ex Nazi or something like that. Like he was actually in the Hitler Youth or something like that. <laughs> kind of crazy. Um, so there's the two guys that were kind of headed up the uh, Hitler Youth for a while. I want to get into next and talk about how Hitler seized power, which uh, he would try to do early on uh, in the 1920s. Uh, if you know about Hitler, uh, there was this thing that happened called the Beer Hall Push, uh, which was a failed coup uh, by the Nazis to take power in Bavaria, where Munich is the city, but was, I guess, the capital of Bavaria uh, at the time. Uh, and uh, if you know about it, it actually happened this week, like yesterday and today. Uh, it's like the 99th year anniversary of it. So I guess next year will be 100 years, I guess, when it happened. Uh, and um, it was kind of an image of Hitler. And uh, he got the backing of some, like, military guys. There was a guy in the middle named Eric von Ludendorff who had been kind of second in command as a general under Hindenburg on the Western Front. He actually backed Hitler. Uh, to basically try to seize power, because uh, I think they were going to do like Mussolini, try to take power uh, in 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 Bavaria, and then take over the rest of Germany uh, as well. And so around 3,000 Nazis tried to take control of the Munich government, like all the main buildings uh, in, in, in Munich, Bavaria. But the police came out, the Munich police came out and actually uh, squashed the whole thing. Uh, 16 Nazis were killed uh, in this incident. Uh, I think it was a case where Hitler was almost killed, like assassinated, uh, when he tried to do it. Uh, and he was arrested for treason uh, at that point. Uh, and what happened was there was a trial afterwards. And they, oh, and by the way, why was it called the Beer Hall Push? I'll kind of explain that about it. But uh, if you know about the Nazis, uh, they would meet in beer halls uh, to discuss whatever kind of political issues they wanted to discuss, like the Hofbrauer House, it's kind of famous in uh, Munich, Bavaria, uh, right there. Uh, but he would often give speeches there. People would drink beer, uh, et cetera, listen to Hitler. Uh, and uh, Hitler really didn't drink. That was the funny thing about it. Uh, but um, basically, uh, that's why they call it the beer hall push. I think he, on the first day of November 8th, he came into that. I think it was that actual, it may have been that actual beer hall of uh, Hofbrauer House, uh, Munich. And he fired a shot shot in the air with his revolver and said that revolution has begun. You know, the Nazis to kind of take over uh, at that point. But he ends up, you know, of course, getting arrested, of course, uh, because of that. Uh, he goes on trial, which I think the trial lasts for like something like three or four weeks. Uh, and he ended up uh, being sent to prison uh, to uh, what is called Landsberg Prison, which is in Bavaria. And when he's in prison, he writes his famous book, of course, you may have heard of, called Mein Kampf, uh, which means uh, in German, uh, my struggle. Uh, this is the actual uh, cell that actual uh, Hitler lived in uh, for like nine months and uh, I think 19, around 1924, 25, uh, and um, his jailers got angry because the fact that people kept coming to visit him, you know, because he was kind of becoming popular in Germany because of the trial and all that. And so they, they said, why don't you write your, like, a autobiography? And so Hitler wrote this autobiography called Mein Kampf, uh, which kind of became, like, his political testament, uh, basically. Uh, actually means my struggle. Uh, that's what it means, or my battle. Uh, and it outlined the Nazi calls, like what the Nazis were going to do uh, when they seized power uh, in Germany. Uh, and it also was his autobiography talking about his early life and his rise to power, rise to, I guess, rise to what he did, I guess, at that point uh, so far. Uh, there's the actual prison uh, that he actually lived in uh, right here. And um, I think there's an irony about the Landsberg prison, if you know about it. The SS later used it as, as a political prison, like to hold people and torture people and things like that. Uh, and so, but yeah, they do think that one thing about Mein Kampf, it, it really predicted kind of what the Nazis were going to do uh, when they would seize control of Germany. Uh, and uh, he even talked about this idea of living strong, living space for Germany, uh, that Germany needed to expand uh, territory wise, uh, which a lot of this would be in the east, like Poland, part of Russia, uh, et cetera. 
Uh, and so a lot of what he said was prophetic. He even talked about trying to kill all the Jews was something he, he kind of kind of discusses too in, in Mein Kampf. And uh, I think a lot of people in Europe and America didn't really know who Hitler was and how, were kind of naive about it, and et cetera. Now I'm going to talk about next, we're going to get into explaining if Germany is going to expand as uh, one thing that's going to happen, you know, because of what happens with the Nazis eventually uh, seizing power. Uh, the big thing that really caused the Nazis to really come to power was the Great Depression. Uh, you have this deal where uh, October 1929, the United States, they had the stock market crash, which a lot of people think there were different calls of why uh, the Great Depression happened, uh, which a lot of it had to do with World War I. It was a big cause of it, uh, which I think a lot of countries never recovered from it after the war. And so it created this huge high unemployment in Germany where millions of people were unemployed. In the United States, it was pretty bad, too. Uh, we had something like 25% unemployment uh, to give you kind of an idea. Uh, and so that's that's kind of what caused Hitler to become more popular uh, and try to you know campaign to uh, get more Nazis into power politically, uh, especially in the Reichstag, uh, in, in the German parliament. Uh, and so uh, because of this, Hitler decided in 1932 to run for president, which he did. Um, he ran against Paul von Hindenburg, who was the actual incumbent, who had already served one term and was going to run for a second term, of course. Uh, and so Hitler Hitler uh, did something that was kind of unique at the time. He was one of the first German politicians to use the airplane to basically, you know, fly around Germany to push uh, the ideas of the Nazi party, uh, et cetera. Uh, and if you know about the uh, airplane, it was made popular because of Charles Lindbergh, who had flown across uh, the Atlantic in 1927, Lucky Lindy. Uh, and so uh, that popularized the use of the airplane everywhere. And so people in Europe and America and all that, uh, et cetera, other parts of the world uh, began to use the airplane more, not just in warfare, but commercial things and stuff like that. Yeah, so there he ran against uh, Paul von Hindenburg, who was by the way, getting pretty old, uh, and uh, but he lost. He lost the election. Some people thought it was suicide, by the way, to run against Hindenburg. He was, you know, very popular uh, general, you know, previously. Uh, but uh, what one thing that's going to happen because you know of the Nazis becoming popular and because of all bad economic times, uh, et cetera, it gave it gave the Nazis eventually a small majority uh, in in the German Reichstag, which you can see here in this image, uh, you know. Yeah, he lost to Hindenburg. Hindenburg got 53% of the vote, uh, and Hitler got about almost 37% uh, of the vote. Lost by like about 6,000 votes, looks like it or so. But you can see there, it gave the NSDAP about 37% of the vote uh, in the Reichstag. And so with that, uh, that, that forced basically Hindenburg uh, to eventually make Hitler chancellor. Uh, which will happen in January of 1933. And uh, this would be part of a coalition government you know, that they would put in power at that point because they thought they could control Hitler initially uh, when he first came in. Uh, by the way, Hindenburg really didn't think much of Hitler. In fact, he called him that corporal or something like that, uh, Lance Corporal, because uh, he had not obtained like a officer's rank or whatever. Uh, and so um, a lot of historians believe that when Hitler, you know, is appointed chancellor uh, in January of 1933, that's the beginning of what we call Nazi Germany, or the Nazis later call it the so-called Third Reich, uh, that they joked with, well, they seriously said that it would last a thousand years, uh, but lasts about a little over 12 years, from 1933 uh, to 1945. Uh, I'm going to explain next, of course, the, the other big thing that happens, of course, too. Hitler, of course, becomes chancellor, like I said, 1933. But one thing that does happen afterwards between 1933 and 1934, the Nazis consolidate their power uh, in Germany uh, to create this one-party state, uh, which it will be, uh, which, again, yeah, between 1933 and 34, like overnight, is, it goes from, from being that. And... Um, 
I'll kind of explain what caused it to actually happen. It actually was caused by an incident that happened uh, in early 1933 uh, called the Reichstag fire. It happened on February 20th, 27th, 1933. The Reichstag building burned down. That's where the Reichstag met, of course, today. Uh, the Reichstag, by the way, is where the Bundstag beats now because they've restored the building, uh, et cetera. And uh, they believe that it was actually set by this Dutch communist named Marinus Vanderloop, who you see on the bottom right, right there, who actually confessed to actually doing it. Uh, there's been all kinds of theories about this whole thing, that it was some kind of communist conspiracy uh, to basically overthrow the country and put communists in, which is what the Nazis and Hitler said. But uh, they think that um, Vanderloop uh, was, I think he was trying to incite some kind of revolution uh, that would overthrow the Nazis. Uh, they used to say it was a hoax, uh, the way the Nazis uh, set fire to it. But I think in recent years, uh, they decided that he did do it. He actually did set the fire uh, himself. Uh, and so... Um, there's kind of another image right here of Marinus Vanderloop. He was later executed for it, I think, in the next year, uh, right afterwards. Uh, and so what happened was then the, the, the Nazis turned around. They used the Reichstag fire as a means to control the state and create a totalitarian Nazi regime. Uh, it was done through what they call uh, in the Enabling Act. Uh, what the Reichstag fire decree did was it basically banned uh, various political parties that were uh, considered like communist or leftist, like socialist, uh, et cetera. Uh, in fact, the only political party you could join after 1933 was the Nazi party. Uh, that's it. And then the Enabling Act, issued also in March, March of uh, 1933, uh, basically made Hitler a totalitarian dictator. It gave him um, emergency powers for like five years uh, where he could suspend uh, the, I guess their constitution and ruled by, I guess, his decrees, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so um, that's how, you know, the Ger Germans were able to basically, the Nazis were able to basically take over the state and make it a one-party regime uh, is what, what they basically did. So that's Vanderloop right there. Uh, so they don't think he was really trying to, you know, actually, uh, you know, I guess a conspiracy like that some people think with that, like other communists involved with him, et cetera. Uh, they think it was just something he thought would happen, but it didn't. Uh, Vanderloo, by the way, is now considered a, a hero in Germany because he tried to stand up uh, to the Nazis. In fact, anybody that's tried to stand up to the Nazis and were killed are now considered, of course, uh, heroes. Yeah, that's the burned out Reichstag building you can see uh, right there. Uh, in that image. That's what it looked like after it was burned. Uh, what's ironic was um, the uh, Reichstag then later met uh, in an opera house uh, in Berlin. You know, if you know about uh, Hitler, he loved operas, especially Richard Wagner. Uh, but the Reichstag was like a, like a kind of like a rubber stamp. Uh, pretty much just Hitler could pretty much do whatever he want as a totalitarian dictator. Uh, that's the uh, the Reichstag building now. That's where the, the main uh, Bundstag, of course, meets today, which you can see it's been restored uh, except for the roof of it. Now, I want to also talk about what Hitler did. So Hitler's, you know, gaining power in Nazi Germany between 1933 uh, to 1934. And so the thing that happened next was Hitler then consolidated his power even more uh, by trying to eliminate enemies. They were, you know, within the actual Nazi party. And so they had this thing that was called either the Night of Long Knives. It was called also the Rom Purge, I think is another name. they call, It was called all kinds of names. I think some people call it the Nazi Blood Purge or Operation Hummingbird, I think was another name uh, they called it. And uh, Hitler eliminated political enemies that were a threat to his power. Uh, and so Ernest Rom and others were killed uh, under him, uh, that's why people call it the Rom Purge, because he was the highest, I guess, official that was killed uh, under him. Because Rom had control of the SA, like the Brown Church, and the Brown Church had like, I want to say, three million men in it or something like that. Uh, and he thought they might overthrow him uh, and take control of the country. And so um, he took the SA and he merged it with the German military afterwards. 
And he made, by the way, the German military take an oath to him later. Uh, when, when I guess he takes over really the whole country. Because that's the thing that happened next about Hitler. Uh, if you know about it, Hindenburg dies uh, in August of 1934. And so uh, he takes the presidency of Germany and he merges it with the chancellorship uh, to create a new position, which is called Führer or the Führer, uh, which meant the leader. The Führer, I think as they usually say, the Führer. Uh, and um, it was done through a national referendum where basically the German people voted on it, and supposedly 90% of the people voted yes uh, for him to become Fuhrer. Uh, what happened to the other 10%? Yeah, that's the thing that's interesting about that one. Um, by the way, the Nazis uh, went with a slogan afterwards, which uh, the major slogan of the Nazis in the Third Reich was Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Fuhrer, which if you go to the German, one people, one empire, one leader. So they're kind of trying to just, you know, restore the whole German empire idea of uh, having like a Kaiser, but it's more like a totalitarian dictator uh, that's actually ruling. Now, I wanted to get in next and talk about also what Hitler did uh, with Germany. So after he took over and became the chancellor and fear of Germany, uh, one thing that Hitler did was he began to rearm the country. So he begins to rearm, you know, the whole armed forces, like the, the, the Wehrmacht, the German armed forces, uh, the Navy, uh, the Air Force, the Luftwaffe uh, is created and expanded uh, pretty much uh, on his watch, which a lot of this was done very secretive, uh, even done uh, in foreign countries. I think it was some cases where they even had some armaments built in Russia, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so um, Hitler then starts to look around for allies, like people that want to, you know, help to join with with fascists like you know Germany uh, at that point. Uh, and so uh, you see here, uh, he then founds this alliance with Italy. He wants to kind of get with them because uh, they're kind of a right wing type government, like they are uh, as well. And so Hitler forms the so-called Rome Berlin Axis, as they originally called it in 1936. And then later on, the Allies would call it the so-called Axis powers uh, that fought them uh, in the war. And uh, initially, the main countries in it were Germany, Italy, and then later Japan joined in 1940 uh, in what became known as the Tripartite Pact uh, as well. But other countries in Europe were part of it as well. Like I think Hungary, Romania, and a few other countries uh, also joined it uh, as well. But Mostly the two main ones were in it in Europe were, of course, Italy and Japan. So it was kind of like a, a economic alliance uh, and later a military alliance. And it kind of is what got basically um, Italy involved in World War II. So here's kind of an image showing you, of course, and we'll get to the Empire of Japan uh, led by Emperor Hirohito uh, at the time. Uh, they kind of get sucked into the war uh, also as well. But those are the main Axis powers that will fight the Allies in, in World War II, which the Allies in World War II would be uh, France and Britain, Soviet Union, United States, uh, China, etc. Uh, one more thing, too, about the fascists. Uh, they did help and kind of instrumentally uh, aiding uh, Francisco Franco in taking over Spain uh, in the late 1930s. Spain went through this thing called the Spanish Civil War, uh, which lasted around three years. And uh, Francisco Franco was a um, Spanish general uh, that seized control uh, of the state. It was a very bloody civil war. Uh, it had you know, two different factions that, that fought, fought in it. And uh, Franco uh, was considered a, a semi a uh, fascist right-wing type dictator uh, who ruled, by the way, uh, over Spain from 1939 to 1975. Uh, and uh, so a lot of people kind of compare them with the fascists in Europe, but I don't know if he was quite seen as a fascist, you know, to people, things like that, but definitely right-wing uh, like they were. And uh, if you know about the Spanish Civil War, uh, it pitted two sides. You had one side, uh, which was the Republican side, which had backed the Second Spanish Republic, uh, which had lasted in the 1930s, 1931 to 39. 
uh, they had this left-leaning popular front. It was called, and it was had all kinds of people in it: communists, anarchists, socialists, uh, etc. Uh, I think they say it was the heyday of the anarchist movement. Uh, if you study about Europe, and uh, they were backed by Soviet Union and Mexico, so they, they aided them with weapons and things like that uh, to try to, you know, get them to stay in power. And then on the nationalist side, the nationalist side with Franco, you see on the right. Uh, they 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 were backed by states like Italy uh, and Germany that were fascist uh, and had all kinds of people in it. A lot of the military, of course, was in it. Uh, conservatives, uh, Catholics, a lot of the Catholic Church backed them too, the monarchists. And they were all co often called Francoists, is what they were dubbed later. And uh, one thing that is interesting about Franco, even though he took over the country, the thing that was surprising about Franco later uh, was he helped reestablish democracy in Spain after he stepped after he died in 1975, uh, if you know about it. But uh, they were known for a lot of political repression. So anybody that was against the regime, uh, they had you arrested. Uh, some cases, people were killed, if you know about that, uh, in Spain uh, for speaking out against the regime. So uh, the Spanish would, by the way, end up being neutral uh, in World War II. Uh, but they would later, you know, uh, back pretty much the fascists, of course, against the Allies. Now, I'm going to talk about one more thing, of course, today, which is the Third Reich, how it eventually comes to power uh, and begins to eventually, uh, you know, take revenge for the Treaty of Versailles. One thing about Hitler, they begin to take back territory that was lost, of course, uh, in, um, you know, from World War I. Uh, Hitler sought revenge, you know, for uh, the Treaty of Versailles. Uh, the West was kind of weak. You know, the League of Nations uh, wasn't really strong enough uh, to really prevent the spread of these fascist regimes uh, from taking over Europe. And the West tended to want to use, like, appeasement, if you, the policy of appeasement to really stop Hitler. And so in 1936, if you know what happened, uh, the Nazis marched into the Rhineland, the western part of Germany right there, which had been a demilitarized zone. Uh, they took it back, uh, basically. Uh, and so uh, the West, like France and Britain, kind of just stared at them, uh, didn't stop them, even though it was considered illegal. That was something that, that Germany first did at that point uh, to kind of expand their power uh, in Europe. Uh, then the other thing that happened that was kind of controversial uh, too uh, was the uh, Germans then uh, took over Austria as well, which uh, Hitler called, I think, originally the so-called Anschluss, as they dubbed it. And um, Anschluss was the idea to annex Austria and it have it part of Germany because, you know, for a long time, you had the so-called German question, this idea that uh, Austria ought to be part of Germany because most of Austrians are German. And so uh, in 1938, um, Germany was able to force Austria to eventually join them, uh, what became later so -called, the so-called Greater Germany. And um, the actual uh, chancellor of Austria, who was Kurt Schusnig, uh, he was forced to accept Nazi rule. Because uh, otherwise, the Nazis were going to still invade uh, anyway uh, and take over. And so Hitler marched into Austria, basically, uh, and took it over and forced them to have a referendum on whether to, you know, Austria to join uh, with Germany. Some people think it was manipulated, the actual vote, uh, by the way. Uh, but supposedly 99% of the population of Austria voted uh, to actually join uh, Germany. Some people thought, saw him as a hero. You see all these people uh, lying the streets, of course. I guess at Vienna, Austria, uh, that you're looking at uh, right here. Uh, and so um, I guess they were forced to kind of be there, maybe uh, some of them also as well. But basically, that's one thing you see that, you know, the West doesn't really do anything about it. And I think some of the British even said that it's all part of the same German garden. You know, they kind of just didn't really do anything about it uh, to really stop it. But there was one thing that was really an issue that, you know, they think that would really cause, you know, almost World War II to happen, of course, in 19, 1938. And that's the issue over uh, what they call uh, Czechoslovakia, especially an area that's called the 
so-called uh, Sudetenland, which if you go back to this map right here, uh, kind of in that area, that's uh, kind of where Prague is. Uh, in uh, 1938, Hitler threatened to take this area of Czechoslovakia, the western part of it, which was a republic uh, after World War I. Uh, it was a pro-German area, which had about 3 million people there. And Hitler wanted it annexed into the Third Reich, into Germany. Uh, and so uh, this created a huge crisis, uh, which led to a diplomatic convention, which happened uh, in um, sep late September of 1938. Uh, in fact, the conference was convened uh, in Munich, Bavaria, between France, Britain, uh, Germany, and Italy. Uh, which, if you know about it, the chain, uh, the actual prime minister of Britain flew to Germany uh, to meet with Hitler, uh, Neville Chamberlain, you're looking at right there. And um, eventually they met over like two days, September 29th to uh, September 30. They decided that they were going to basically annex part of the western part and give it to the Germans uh, with what was called the so-called Munich Agreement or something called the Munich Pact, uh, and uh, they would basically give Hitler that western part where Prague is in exchange for peace. You know, so land for peace deal was pretty much uh, what, what they would do. Uh, and so the western half, the western half of Czech Czechoslovakia would disappear uh, with this agreement. That's actually before the signing where they met on September 29th, you can see uh, the men that were there, by the way, uh, at, at the actual uh, conference of the agreement and all that, uh, Chamberlain from Britain, of course, on the far left. Uh, you've also got Edward Dallier, of uh, course, next to Hitler. Uh, Benito Mussolini, of course, on the right of Hitler also uh, as well. Uh, so there's all, all the people that were there uh, at the signing. And, of course, the... Um, you know about the uh, Czechs, the Czechs called it the Munich Betrayal, because it basically sold their country down the river, is what they did uh, in exchange for peace. And uh, they do think that the whole, you know, the whole, the whole Munich Agreement, you know, that they did was considered one of the worst examples of appeasement that the Western powers tried to do uh, to prevent, you know, World War II uh, from happening. And it, it failed. It totally failed, uh, if you know about that. And they think Neville Chamberlain was one of the archetypes that really helped set that, of course, in the West. Uh, and um, there, of course, is you know Chamberlain on the left with Hitler. He actually trusted Hitler. He thought Hitler was a guy that he could trust. Uh, he thought that you know Hitler wouldn't seek any more land, you know, after after this uh, land for peace deal. And so what Chamberlain did, he actually flew back to uh, to Britain, to England, you know, and uh, when he got off the plane, uh, he held this piece of paper in the air. You see there, you know, the whole thing that Hitler promising that he's not going to, you know, take more land. And he said the famous statement, I believe it is peace for our time. Uh, and, of course, that, that proved to be, you know, totally wrong. It was one of the things that happened. To totally erroneous statement by by Chamberlain. And, you know, within around a year, they're going to be, of course, uh, at war uh, with Nazi Germany. Uh, so uh, they couldn't stay up here. They should have probably said, no, you're not going to take that land or it's going to be war. Uh, but the allies like the West, France, Britain, really didn't want to fight a war because uh, they had just fought World War I, lost a lot of men, lost, what, probably three, four million men. Uh, so they didn't really want to fight another war at this point. Uh, so yeah, peace, peace for our time. That's of course the famous you know quotes you see there uh, with that that of course statement by Chamberlain. Uh, by the way, you can see here what happens to Czechoslovakia. Uh, basically, it gives uh, the Nazis and Hitler a green light to go in and take the eastern part uh, of also Czechoslovakia, which will divide into two states: Bohemia, Moravia, kind of a German protectorate, and they create a country, Slovakia. Uh, which is in the eastern part of it uh, as well. And you can see uh, Hungary uh, kind of comes in and kind of annexes part of it uh, also uh, as well. 
And so, yeah, you, 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 you're looking at a thing here where Hitler's then planning to do the next thing, which is going to invade Poland. The invasion of Poland is going to be the thing that they're going to do next. Of course, uh, that'll you know lead to uh, World War II breaking out. And so you'll get the beginning of you know World War II uh, that you're going to have uh, by, by 1939 because of all these policies that uh, Hitler's pushing and the Western powers aren't trying to stop him. Uh, pretty much. So that's that's how, you know, Hitler's able to rise to power uh, and, of course, and cause World War II uh, to break out uh, within just a decade or so. Uh, this, of course, occurring. So next week, next week, I'm, of course, going to be moving on uh, to talk about, you know, uh, World War II. I'll talk about the outbreak of World War II uh, when Nazi Germany invades Poland. That's going to bring in Britain and France uh, into the war. So I'll talk about the early part of the war, uh, I'll talk about also how um, what happens in you know, Soviet Union gets in the war course when Nazi Germany invades them. Then I'll also talk about how the United States uh, enters the war December 1941 because of the rise of the Empire of Japan uh, that tax, of course, uh, Pearl Harbor. So uh, that's pretty much it for the week. Uh, before I go, I did want to remind you about assignments that I had out there. I uh, told you, of course, the second exam, uh, of course, is the main assignment uh, y'all need to, of course, be working on right now. Uh, World War I quiz also as well. And I did give you that second exam bonus quiz also to do uh, as well. Uh, of course, next week we do have some assignments due as well. I think the, I know the third vocab is going to be coming due uh, also as well. And then don't forget, I did push back the book report date. Uh, I think I told you it was Monday. Uh, November 28th is going to be the date of when it'll be uh, when it'll be due, you know, in Canvas. Uh, mm -hmm. So I, I'm giving you more time, you know, over Thanksgiving to kind of work on that later because uh, we don't have too many weeks left, of course, of classes at BRCC. So anyways, kind of talking about, you know, the rest of the semester and all that, uh, et cetera. I'm thinking our second, ex our, our final exam is probably going to be mostly like on like World War II. I think that's what I'm kind of looking at uh, for now. So that's it for today. Let's look like I have any questions. I know comments, of course. But uh, like I said, if you have a comment question, you can always leave those later to me uh, on YouTube or also uh, in the uh, comment section, in the discussion section in uh, Canvas. So that's it. Y'all have a great weekend, by the way, uh, coming up. So y'all take care.